Jesus said, I do not call you servants any longer. I call you friends. Our son Matthew was diagnosed at a very young age with dyspraxia. Dyspraxia is a disorder of muscle coordination and low muscle tone. It's what used to be known in the bad old days as clumsy child syndrome. And he was a clumsy child. If there was something to trip over, he would trip over it. If there was a muddy puddle to fall into, he would fall into it. But he had a heart of gold and a big smile. I remember once taking him back to school after the Easter holidays. He was delighted to spot his friend Stephen on the other side of the playground and he rushed over to him. I saw him reach out his hand and take Stephen's school bag off him as they were playing together. Then the bell went and Stephen made a rush for the door wanting to be the first one in leaving Matthew carrying the two school bags. And you've guessed it. He tripped over in the playground. He landed in a muddy puddle. He grazed both his knees. He covered himself with mud and he ruined the nice new school coat and scarf that I'd bought for him. But the smile was still intact. He ran up to me, still carry carrying the two school bags. And while I cleaned him up, I said to him, Next time, you tell Stephen to carry his own bag. And straight away came the answer. But he's my friend. And there it was. There you have it, the heart of the gospel on the lips of a four-year-old child. He's my friend. Jesus said, I call you friends. This piece of scripture is unique. It's the only place where Jesus calls his disciples his friends. He has other names for them in other places. Sometimes they are less than complimentary. But here and now it's different. Here they are called his friends. I wonder if the author of this gospel may have chosen this word deliberately because he wanted us to notice it, to be surprised by it, to remember it. Maybe he wanted this message to stand out. So why friends? And why now? And what has this to do with us? Why friends? We don't find much about friends and friendship in the Gospels. But it's right there, underneath the surface. We see it right at the start of the story, in the way that Jesus wasted no time reaching out to others and gathering a group of people around him to share his journey, his hopes and dreams, and his mission. We see it in the easy, warm relationships he had with so many with Martha and Mary and Lazarus, with Zacchaeus, Nicodemus, Mary Magdalene. We see it in the crowds that he drew and the kind of conversations that he had. He was compassionate, outgoing, accepting, kind, straight-talking and self-giving. 
The author C.S. Lewis described friendship as the freest and most liberating of all the human loves. He writes, Friendship cares nothing for family, profession, class, income, race or previous history. It has nothing to do with duty or obligation or satisfying demands. It is the least likely to be tainted by our own need to be needed. It is freely entered into, freely shared and freely laid down. Friends share a common vision, a common passion joint seekers of the same God, the same beauty, and the same truth. I call you friends, says Jesus. So why now? This passage comes in the so-called farewell discourses spoken by Jesus just before his betrayal, trial and death were about to take place. You would think that the mood would be sombre, with an air of resignation and defeat, but no. There's a great sense of peace in these passages, a feeling of serenity. Just as Jesus had broken the bread and poured the wine and invited all present to share in the meal, now he invited them as friends to be partakers of what it was that that meal symbolised. To take the way of self-giving love that is the gateway to newness of life to a new way of being human. And so, not simply to be sharers of his hopes and dreams, but to be part of the means of bringing them about. And if that seems a huge demand to place on ordinary human beings, he gave them a special gift to help them. Each other. Love one another. Love one another. That way everyone will know that you're with me. That you are my friends. There is one faith group that has taken these words completely to heart. The Religious Society of Friends, or the Quakers, who were formed in the 17th century by George Fox and some others, who were concerned that the church of the day was giving little attention to the spiritual experience of ordinary people. Quakers call each other friend. They have no hierarchy, no clergy, no sacraments, no creeds or set beliefs except for one, that there is that of God in every human being. That particular way of faith may not suit everyone. But throughout history, groups of Christians have always come together to form communities and fellowships in order to follow their faith in a way that is authentic for them. These may be religious communities, such as Iona or Teze, or religious orders, such as the Benedictines and the Franciscans and our own Methodist diaconal order. Or they can be our own local church communities. 
following Jesus and taking the way of self-giving love can be a daunting and difficult thing for us. We can only really do it from within the strong supportive bonds of friendship and community. We're not a collection of separate individuals, each working out our own personal salvation. Our glory comes from realising our interconnectedness. As Martin Luther King wrote, We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. What affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be, he writes, unless you are what you ought to be. This is the way God's universe is made. This is the way it is structured. We go through life together, marking out our rites of passage together. We work out our faith together. We share our joys and sorrows. We carry one another's burdens or school bags. We sink or swim together. Joint seekers of the same God, the same beauty, the same truth. Making real the hopes and dreams and mission of Jesus, our master and our friend.